If you think talking about mental illness is scary, imagine what happens when we don't talk about it. Join the conversation. Visit Let's Talk Stigma. Dot org. Hello, I'm Frank Camerata, Executive Director of the Erie County Office for People with Disabilities and Board Member of the Erie County Anti-Stigma Coalition. On behalf of the Coalition, I would like to welcome you to this month's Facebook Live event, another great opportunity to meet with experts in the field and discuss timely concerns. This time, we're focusing on the state of stigma and the stress and mental wellness of service providers and families of people with developmental disabilities. I would like to start today by acknowledging the recent passing of Ms. Judy Human, who was a very important person in disability rights now, th that are now guaranteed by the Americans with Disabilities Act following her many heroic acts of bravery. Each year in March, we celebrate Developmental Disabilities Awareness Month. Every March, 20, every March 21st, we celebrate International Down Syndrome Day to focus on people with Down Syndrome, which is a developmental disability caused when a person is born with an extra copy of chromosome 21, thus 321. According to the Center for Disease Control, developmental disabilities occur among all racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic groups. Estimates in the United States show about one in six or 17% of children aged three through 17 have one or more developmental disabilities, such as attention deficit hyperactive disorder, autism spectrum disorder, cerebral palsy, intellectual disability, or learning disability. Approximately 7,800 people in Erie County receive services from the New York State Office for People with Developmental Disabilities. Some people with a developmental disability live independently, while others require different levels of assistance and care throughout their lives, including from parents, family members, and state and local agencies. Our discussion today will focus upon the stress and mental wellness of service providers and families of people with developmental disabilities. According to the U.S. Department of Labor, a 2019 issue brief estimates that 4.5 million people in the United States are direct care workers, 87% of whom are women and 53% are women of color. We have a terrific panel of very experienced professionals today and family members with lived experience who I know will be candid on this topic. Before I introduce our panelists, just a couple of housekeeping rules. Our program is one hour. During this time, if you have a question or a comment, please type it into the chat box and we will respond accordingly. Your questions and input often lead to terrific dialogue, so please don't be shy. There is no such thing as a silly question, as we, all, we are all here to learn today. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our panelists. First up, Max Donatelli. Max is a proud parent who, along with his wife, Joyce Donatelli, have two beautiful children, Connie and Craig. Craig is 34, has Down syndrome, and lives semi-independently in self-directed services for almost 10 years and has worked in competitive employment as long. The family are recognized advocates for people with developmental disabilities, those with mental health challenges, and for inclusion and equity, locally and statewide. Max retired from Baker Victory Services, now OLV Human Services, in 2016 after 42 years in roles including direct care worker, clinician, director, helping high-risk youth in foster care and families, and is former executive director of Parent Network of Western New York. Among other advocacy roles, he is a founding member of the Anti-Stigma Coalition and the Developmental Disabilities Alliance Family Committee. Welcome, Max. Welcome. Our next person is Stacy Book. She is a self-direction specialist coordinator with People Incorporated. She has been a, D a DSP since 2009, working in multiple departments, beginning with residential, then day habilitation, and most recently, self-directed services. Stacy briefly volunteered as a puppeteer with Kids on the Block, which toured schools and performed skits geared toward helping children understand various disabilities and how they can best support and befriend them. Outside of work, she is a wife and mother of one child and loves to dabble in creative forms of expression, including special effects makeup, 
body painting, photography, and film. Welcome, Stacy. Thank you for having me. And then we have Renee Phillip. Renee graduated with her master's degree from State University of New York at Buffalo. After graduation, Renee pursued a career in foreign service with her area of expertise in political strategy. During that time, she worked on negotiations for foreign policy, countervailing diplomacy, and game theory application to live negotiations. She also ran a trade mission program that led international diplomats and trade leaders into the United States to become better acquainted with the understanding of trade as a vehicle for global collaborations. Through her career, she has gained experience as a chief of staff and executive vice president of government and community relations at Simonelli Real Estate and led the Buffalo Niagara Partnerships Leadership Program and Life Sciences Industry Program. She was most recently COO of UBMD Physicians Group. They are the medical school faculty who see patients at over 80 locations and staff ECMC and the Kaleida Health System. In this capacity, Renee was involved in creating UB Associates, the management services organization for the entity, as well as positioning the practice plan for managed care. She was named president and chief executive officer of Aspire of Western New York in 2019. Her most important role is that of being mom to her 21-year-old son, Marshall, who has Down syndrome. Having Marshall is the best thing I have ever done with my life, she states emphatically. Welcome to all of our panelists, and thank you so much for joining us today. Let's get the topic, let's get to the important topic at hand. First question, Renee. We have numerous agencies in Western New York providing services to people with developmental disabilities. Can you describe the work of these service agencies? Sure, um, I'd be happy to, and thanks again for inviting me to participate in this very valuable um, discussion. So Aspire is one of many uh, not-for-profit agencies in Western New York that do provide services for people within the, uh, with developmental disabilities, um, intellectual and otherwise, and the scope is, is, is runs the gamut. There are some agencies like Aspire where we have actual school programs. Um, we run programs from early intervention right through to end of life palliative care in our group homes. And that would comprise things such as a preschool, um, integra integrated preschools with um, community uh, programs like Educates. Uh, we also have an actual traditional school um, at, uh, in Chictawaga through age 21. Most individuals with IDD uh, typically go to school through the age of 21. Um, and then we have the transition services that find placements, work placement opportunities in the community, whether they be, um, um, you know, out in the community working, out in the community volunteering, uh, helping individuals um, develop supports in terms of just the community safety engagement. We have day hab programs where individuals come in um, as much as sometimes five, five days a week. Um, to be engaged and learn and develop um, their own skills, whether it be on the technology end or life skills. Uh, and then we have kind of an interim where there's day have without walls, where they're out in the community more still learning those types of skills. Um, there are residential group homes with uh, a variety of different um, components to them. Some um, have a collective of group uh, of individuals in the group that are um, fairly independent and very active. And others, uh, group homes are um, designed specifically to support people who are uh, medically quite fragile, fragile, or or have heavy behavioral issues where they need supports and interventions as well. And then we obviously work with the med medical community. We have clinics. Um, agencies like ourselves have medical clinics, whether they be for therapies, speech, PT, and OT, or um, actual just primary care clinics as well. Um, and, uh, you know, we run in the engagement and we work with our colleagues in the medical system to help support and ensure that the people that um, all of us are responsible for are getting the best care, both uh, in the physical capacity and also, you know, in the mental and social emotional support as well. So that's kind of the general overview of what, what some of the services might be in our community. That's a lot of services and it must take quite a few number of staff. Do, do you, I'm sure you know how many uh, direct service providers you have. Um, for Aspire alone, we have over 750. So it's almost half of our workforce, right? Wow, that's, wow, yeah. And, and those those are direct hands-on people. So Stacey, every day. 
Yeah. Stacy, pretty much the same at People Incorporated. Is there is there any is there is there much difference between People Incorporated and, and Aspire of Western New York? Well, I think every agency does have its little specifics and there are some areas that each agency kind of uh, specializes in or maybe has more of a hand in than others do. So there's there is some balance and there's some gap filling from either, you know, from other agencies, not just Aspire and People Inc., but all the different ones here and across the country. Um, similar, of course, we if there's a need, we try and be a provider of of that need. You know, like we try to assist with that need. So we want to make sure that we are supporting as fully as possible. Um, you know, and I think every agency, b- bigger agencies like Aspire and People Inc., really try to fill as many of those gaps as possible. And smaller ones, you know, as they grow, as more people, you know, receive services and have needs, they tend to expand into those areas as well. Okay, okay. thank you. Max, direct care at the agencies is provided, right? As, as, uh, um, as Renee and Stacy just described to us, uh, what is a direct service professional? Well, a direct service professional or direct support professional is is um, really somebody who's working. Uh, primarily, they mostly are in group homes. Uh, individual residential alternatives are also called. Uh, but they also work in the community uh, through self-directed. They also have day hip um, direct support professionals. Uh, but they're really the the backbone of the of these organizations, and uh, you know, and and they really are uh, ones that, you know, take care of, you know, whatever the needs are that, uh, you know, that the people that they're serving, uh, whether they're younger children, whether they're um, teens or, or adults, and they're, um, you know, really doing everything from, uh, you know, where, where they're very high needs individuals, you know, they may help them with bathing, they may help them with, with feeding, they may help them with uh, you know, just everyday kinds of uh, activities of daily living uh, and getting them out in the community, medical appointments and so on and so on. So there's a variety. And 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 as the are people that, you know, are more mobile and those that can can access the community, they may be providing support for them, maybe helping them with shopping, maybe helping them, you know, out in the community, recreating, you know, so so there's a real wide range of the kinds of supports and services that they provide everything from and really dependent on the individuals themselves, the people themselves and what they are capable of and what they, you know, whatever their disability may be inhibiting them from performing uh, and getting their best lives. So, so Stacy, uh, Max touched upon people who are a little more independent. Is that what self-direction is about? Uh, so it can be as well. Um, I myself, I, I uh, work as a life coach in addition to specialist coordinator. Um, and the young woman that I assist is in a wheelchair and she has some physical limitations. Um, but that doesn't always, that isn't always the case. It's really, uh, we try to meet the people where they're at. We try to meet you where you're at and kind of help with the needs that, you know, you struggle. It's a, it's a give and take really. Um we do see in self-direction there is a more independent component um, as opposed to like someone who may be in residential or day program. Um, generally speaking, those are situations where that person might have more behavioral struggles or more medical struggles or just need more round the clock assistance mm-hmm. as opposed to some of our folks who can, you know, mostly live independently in the community, but maybe need assistance with some daily living activities or even, you know, some personal hygiene tasks, um, all the way through to things like meditation practices and helping them with their hobbies and interests and and just exploring life and what it has to offer. Okay. Renee, uh, I, I, I pointed out from the U.S. Department of Labor that there are, there are four and a half million people who in this country are direct care workers. What, what's, what's the calling to become? A, a direct care worker or a, a direct service provider or a direct service professional? Yeah, well, they're incredibly selfish and special individuals, right? These are people, and as Stacy and Max, you know, referenced a moment ago, these people do everything from taking, you know, um, individuals, bathing them, 
cleaning G tubes, feeding them, um, helping with behaviors if they're struggling with behaviors, to the more what you might more see on the public side, going out into the community. Maybe some of you have seen groups of individuals or an individual with a, a, a life coach or a job coach or group shopping or you know at uh, if they, at the fair or what have you. Um, but it's 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 heavy work, right? It's not just you punch in, you punch out. I know many of the DSPs, you know, in our organization, you know, have very close familial relationships with the people they support, right? They care about them. They worry about them. When they go home, it's not just checking out, I'm, flip, I'm done flipping hamburgers for the day. These are individuals that they've developed really close um, connections with. Um, and sometimes in a way, um, as close as family, but different because they're not family, right? So there's that di there's that dynamic there. So you know, it, it's just it takes special special people. And I can tell you, I'm a parent of a child with Down syndrome, but to be able to do that uh, as a calling every day, um, it takes a it takes an incredible uh, person who isn't necessarily. Um, involved in it with a family member or um, has some sort of relationship with someone with IDD. It, 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 sound, it sounds like pretty amazing work. And it, it sounds like uh, for, for people who are called to do that work, they are, they, they sound like really terrific people. Um, and I, and I, guess I, yeah, I was going to say, I guess I should say that uh, I was I was in the field many years ago myself, so it's uh, you know the, the the four of us on this call it's uh, we 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 have a we have a good understanding of what's going on. But Renee, I'm sorry I interrupted. No, no, the, I was just going to say that when I see the DSPs in action, whether they're out in their community or when I'm in a group home or in a dayhab setting, wherever, it is probably one of the most inspiring things I see during the course of my day, if not the most inspiring thing, to see that relationship, to see that empowerment, to see that connection. Um, it's selfless work and um, it's it's really a beautiful thing to see. Okay. Stacy, what do you think are some of the biggest challenges uh, faced by <laughs> DSPs on a daily basis? Because it, well, it sounds like very challenging work as well. It is. It is. It's it's people helping people. And that's always going to be messy. You know, we have two wonderful parents on this panel that have children with developmental disabilities. And I, you know, want this to be spoken with the intent that it is with all the love that is coming from me. Um, but sometimes one of the more challenging parts can be the families. Honestly, there are situations that you run into where and I'm a mom. Too. I have uh, an eight-year-old, well, almost eight-year-old who has ADHD and some other things that we're working out right now. So I, I am learning to understand it from that, that side of things. There is the, uh, an intense element of like self-awareness and self-reflection that you have to do as a DSP because you have to balance that of being a very familial person to the individual receiving services, the person that you're supporting. But you're not family. You are on the clock. You are paid support for that person. So always maintaining that level of professionalism and boundaries. We had this discussion about boundaries. You know, those are crucial. And and like I said, with the families thing, it's it's checking in on yourself, checking in and being aware of who you are, where you're at, how you can best support people, and then knowing how to communicate those needs. So being able to communicate with the families is a huge way to get over those frustrations you may have because they see this person as their family, their son, their uncle, their loved one, but you see them as just the adult human that they are, you know? And so there can be a lot of give and take and balancing and trying to meet the whole circle of support where they are, you know? So that, that does, that is kind of probably the core component of it is just being able to keep all of those irons turning in the fire and, also do that while living your own personal life and having your own irons to turn, you know, so just balancing that. It's always about being communicative and checking in with yourself and checking in with your team. Max, I'm, I'm going to, I want to include you in on this too. You know, you're a parent, uh, but I also know you as, as somebody who volunteers their time uh, working with people with developmental disabilities a lot. Uh, what do you feel are some of the challenges 
that uh, some of the greatest challenges that are faced by DSPs? Well, I think the one thing I think Stacy hit on, I think some very, very good points. And, and I think what I'd kind of go, you know, and add on to that is the, you know, is that there are really, we have real problems with um, not, a, not having enough staff. And, and, you know, one of the core issues with that has been the pay. And, um, you know, we can't, you know, really kind of continue the discussion without really identifying that, um, you know, that New York State and, and the federal government really need to be able to come through with, with um, you know, enough funding to be able to, uh, to pay these individuals what they're worth. And they're worth a lot. I mean, we rely on staff at, uh, you know, the, with, with Craig, where Craig lives, Craig lives uh, semi-independently in a, um, in a uh, self-directed uh, living situation uh, through Aspire uh, with the Renee's agency. And uh, the, the staff there, I mean, we rely on them. We have to be able to trust them. We have to be able to know that they're doing uh, the kind of things that, uh, you know, helping Craig and the other young men that are living there, um, you know, being able to get the kind of things they need to be learning independent living skills and so on. Uh, but I think one, one of the other things I think, you know, the pay issue, and that's something we do with advocacy, and that's that's some one of the things that, you know, certainly Renee and, and I'm sure Stacy were involved in doing advocacy and, and really trying to make the, you know, the uh, our legislators and our governor aware of how important it is to see that that uh, pay does increase and, and, and it's above the minimum wage because these are not minimum wage jobs. These are very responsible jobs that require specialized training. And, um, you know, and, and it can be very s stressful depending on the situations like Stacy identified and, and Renee mentioned. Um, uh, and <clears throat> I think one of the other components I think is, is also good supervision. Um, you know, one of the things that I lasted at, at um, uh, Baker Victory Services, now OLV, the reason I lasted 42 years is because I had very good supervisors um, and uh, so good supporters and a good uh, 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 colleagues uh, and, and, a, a, and different staff teams that we worked together and were able to trust one another and, um, you know, so and, and help to create cultures that were um, there for the best of the people that we served. And, um, you know, so I think that, you know, those are some, at least some of the things that I see, you know, as being important because uh, this kind of work is, you know, as Stacy mentioned, could be messy. It's not always easy. It's not always easy. And, and I mean, certainly it can be very fulfilling and a lot of fun, you know, and, and you know, uh, some of the sense of humor is some of folks that, that uh, you know, I, I've been working at Craig's house and, and supporting because we've had some staff problems where we've actually had to fill in as parents and, and working with the guys at Craig's house. And, and, you know, it's kind of like going back to my days as a, you know, working in the cottages at Baker and, uh, you know, and, but th there's a lot of fun with it, but there's also, you know, there's also some responsibilities and some of these guys are, are you know, they can be needy at times and they need support and they need supervision. And we have to entrust the people um, you know, that, that we hire there that are going to be responsible and like what they do, you know, and, and I think that that's a big part of it, that it's not just a job. It's like, like Renee said, it's not flipping hamburgers. It's not in, in, in retail where you can just kind of leave the thing at, you know, at the job. This is something that's, that's, uh, you know, it's, it's a calling. So, so thank you, Max. Uh, Renee, would you like to add anything to that? Uh, Max, Max and Stacy did a did a really good job of giving that picture. But I think you, as a as a CEO in one of the agencies, you you probably can add a little bit more to it uh, regarding yeah. the challenges. Yeah, well, and the challenges is um, is staffing. So we know there was a staffing crisis in our industry for DSPs prior to the pandemic, and the pandemic just really kind of accelerated that whole. Um, that whole staffing crisis to a point where it is still a staffing crisis. And sometimes agencies um, have had to close programs or suspend programs because we just don't have the people to run them. So we have the, certainly the demand is there, but the, you know, the, the actual um, ability to, to administer a program is not available. Um, and, you know, and, and Max said it perfectly, you, you the, DSP, DSPs are, are 
grossly underfunded for the, the, the nature of the work that they do. And so that has been a constant drumbeat to our local officials, who I have to say our local electeds are very well uh, informed and knowledgeable. And they do take that call and that conversation right up to Albany through their work. And uh, we're always around to continue to remind them about that. Um, but it's also about, um, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the pay, right? The majority of the agencies um, receive their funding through Medicaid. I think Aspire is about just under 90% funded by Medicaid. So we can't make more widgets or more lemonade to be able to give the money that we want to give to yeah. to these DSPs. So that's a difficult, you know, that's a difficult cha challenge. And we're also very mindful of the burnout issue, right? And and because because we're short staffed, we have to have um, a, you know a minimum safe, meaning based on the dynamic of the house or or the the um, program that that person is in, um, we can't go below a number of DSPs. So sometimes we have to mandate extra shifts. So here you are, a DSP, thinking that you're going to go home at the end of your shift, and you can't, right? And sh I see Stacy shaking her head, right? So you know, so it's and it, and it's a problem, and it's difficult to do. So we're as these you know balancing the advocacy for more pay, but also trying to surround much like we have circles of supports for individuals. Our agency is trying to be very very cognizant about the stressors that are involved in being a DSP. Right. Not only just the day to day, um, but you mentioned uh, a lot of these are women. A lot of these are minorities. Um, some of them are, you know, economically challenged. So it's this it's this this issue of, um, you know, do I work the extra shift? But who's going to take my take my child off the bus? Right. Um, and what happens with all of that? And so I think I know Aspire is and I know other agencies in our community are really starting to be. Um, very cognizant about proactively being available to support those needs. If it's anything from trying to be a little bit more flexible in the work schedules, if we can, right? Or, you know, our EAP programs and, and um, you know, building more of a, a better understanding of collegial communication between and among the different divisions, right? So we're actually having divi different divisions training and coming in as DSPs, right? So that's, that's uh, some of the few challenges. Um, that you know we have as, a, as an agency, and and I was gonna I was gonna mention too. You you talk about mandating staff. Uh, in, what about weather events? Right, you know, it, unfortunately, because of, because of the two giant storms that we just we've just had here in the in Western New York, unfortunately, these are these DSPs are people who have to be in the houses to provide the services, right? And they can't leave until somebody is able to come in, and we know that. People weren't able to get in, right? Right. To your point, we've had people um, during the, the Christmas um, holiday storm, we blizzard, we had people, staff um, in the homes for five days. And we were trying to support them in terms of getting them um, connections, doing FaceTiming with their Christmas, their, their Christmas with their family members, right? And just making sure that they had that that connection home. So yeah, your point is well, well, well taken. Um we, we, we have a couple of questions here uh, and it kind of kind of relates to, you know, where we're going with with regard to the challenges. Uh, you know, for, I guess, first question, what's being done to encourage self-care for the direct care workers? Uh, Renee, can I hand that off to you first? Sure. Yeah. So it's it's really starting to look about that. And you're seeing the industry. So it's not just Aspire in Western New York, but really across the industry, um, looking at the individual DSP as a whole. Right. Like this is this is, you know, a mom, a sister, a brother, a wife or a husband, a parent, a child. Right. So really looking at the individual, it's like they're not just a body that comes in, does their work and leaves. And what types of supports do they actually need? There's an actual survey um, taking place on the state level that's interviewing DSPs to get at the heart of that actual conversation, right? What are your stressors? What are your pain points? What goes well for you during the course of your day? So we can really start advocating and um, direct funding to supporting the DSP um, work component, which is different than other roles within the agency. So it's, um, you know, we are always talking about, um, uh, in our agency anyway, about the ability to allow people to feel vulnerable and to develop trust so that when things are going, you know, um, 
are more challenging than others for certain people or certain situations. You know, it's almost based on kind of around that trauma informed care, right? That when you come in, you're already coming in with whatever your home life has, right? And then you're coming into a difficult situation, um, oftentimes as much as you love your job. And how do you strike that balance? So we're really actively identifying that at the state level um, through, a, a, through a, um, a professional survey that's being done. I believe it's out of the Miami of Ohio um, they're doing that work. Um, and then we're going to take that information and really start having the agencies come back and formulate their own respective plans, but then also different ways that we can go to OMH, the Office of Mental Health, and our other agencies and the Division of Budget to say, see, we really do need more than just the dollar figure of the people here. Um, so I hope that helps. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. If anyone is just joining us, I'm Frank Camerata from the Erie County Anti-Stigma Coalition, and I'm joined by Stacy Book, Self-Direction Specialist Coordinator from People, Inc., Max Donatelli, parent, family advocate, and retired service professional, and Renee Phillips, CEO from Aspire of Western New York. Today, we are discussing the stress and mental wellness of service providers and families of people with developmental disabilities. Everyone joining us, please take a moment and check out our website, Let's talk stigma.org and maybe join nearly 4,000 others in taking the pledge to end stigma. Also, if you are connected with a business, organization, or faith community, you can become an organizational member of the Anti Stigma Coalition. You can find information for this on the website under the members tab. Now, back to our panelists. So we're talking about, you know, we're talking about the, diff the difficulties of the job, the challenge, I shouldn't say difficulties, the, the challenges of the job. Um, and, you know, I, I think, you know, in a way, uh, you are all, you are all, you were, you are all DSPs. And uh, how, how do the, how do you handle the stresses of the job? How do you personally handle the stresses of the job? Um, I'll, I'll, let me start with Max. Well, I, well, I think what, um, you know, they, some there are some things that can be controlled and i think that i think that's one of the things that's that's really i think very, the real dilemma right now is as uh, renee talked about with the staffing crisis because um you know in the past and and you know back back when i was a dsp which was many years ago um you know the the, the staffing crisis there wasn't a staffing crisis that you know i mean we we hired i think pretty responsible and and you know and and competent and motivated and people that really wanted to be there, you know, and, and, and not to say that that's not the case today, but it, it is more difficult to really get people that are real, that this is really something that they really want to do and that they really want to stay in the human services field. So I think that, you know, if, if somebody's really working and they really like what they're doing and it's, they're motivated to doing it, um, you know, and, and, you know, wherever the, the, you know, supervisors can help with, um, you know, providing the right kind of support, some of the things that Renee talked about that they're trying to do with, you know, within, you know, the Aspire agency, you know, those kind of things are helpful. But the, the, the things like mandatory overtimes and, and, you know, those kind of things, I mean, they do burn staff out. And, and you know, and that's why I think every effort is being made you know, at all, a lot of different levels, you know, uh, family groups uh, such as the Donnie Family Committee and and uh, Donnie itself, the Developmental Disability Alliance of Western New York, you know, are really very, you know, as being as proactive as possible, really trying to help to see that um, that funding can be there so that this that, that we're able to pay the staff because that, that is a, it, it is a bread and butter issue. And, and, and certainly if you're working and, and you have to you know, put your, your, your own family second fiddle, you know, and you don't have that work-life balance, then, then certainly there's going to be some, some, you know, real problems with somebody staying in a job, even though they may like it, if, if they're, you know, have to really, you know, have their, their own family be the, the you know, the, taking second fiddle to the, to this, then, you know, then it's really going to be, become where we're, we're going to be losing good people and we do lose good people. You know, and, and I guess that's, you know, the real challenge is, is you know, really trying to offer all the things that are there, the, you know, that, that management administration can provide, can provide support, help with the culture. But there are certainly some things that are outside of the control. And, and I think as much as we, you know, we can 
you know, uh, funding isn't everything, but it certainly is a is a major part in you know in running not for profit agencies. Stacy, what are your thoughts on on you know handling the stresses of the job? Yeah. Um, okay. So I really can speak at this point only on what's going on in my agency, but just being invited mm -hmm. to something like this or having this opportunity lets me know that in the 14 years that I've been doing this, that the environment is changing for the better, ideally. And that's what we always want is every, you know, so many years you want to look back and go, wow, we were really kind of whiffing it with how we were doing things before, but we've come so much, you know, so, so far. And hopefully 10 years from now, we're going to look back and say, wow, we were really in the stone age back then with how we looked at DSPs and now look at where we're at and now look what it's like. Um, and I, you know, over the last 14 years can say that I see that change coming and that there is more respect. We are, we are graded as DSPs on core competencies, on, on things that we are expected to be able to not only thoroughly understand and be able to do ourselves, but to support somebody else with needs in doing that as well and doing that as independently as possible. And that is a lot of stress, especially if you feel like in your personal life, maybe you don't have as good of a handle on things as you would like. How can I then come in and help somebody else with, with their life and their activities of daily living? So there is a lot of culture shift in talking about employee assistance programs and then even identifying some of the shortcomings with those and saying, you know what, this is what's available, but we from the top down need to do better in supporting the backbone of our workforce. From the top down, putting people in leadership roles that are there to support and lead and drive the, the, the ethics that we all want to operate on. You set that from the top down and then you build that base to go out there and support the folks that we serve. Um, but it is hard. It is the stress similar to that of your healthcare workers. So think of your nurses, your CNAs, your doctors, people that are responsible for medications and, and your physical and mental well-being, but then also having to be hands-on with maybe dressing and feeding and uh, you know, helping with private bathroom time and then doing things like taking them to Darien Lake and going to visit friends. It's its the whole gamut of the human experience and it's heavy. It is. But I think that we are going in the right way with having these conversations, having platforms like this, having CEOs be a part of discussions like this and saying, this is what I'm doing to make sure that my people are good. And, and speaking of CEOs, Renee, would you like to add anything? How, is, is Aspire doing anything different or, or special with regard to assisting their staff with the stresses of the job? Well, we're actually having conversations. Um, we start, started a book club last year and we started with um, the C-suite and then the senior management and it's going down. We're pushing it through the agency um, and we're having four a quarterly retreats this year. And it's all about um, open communication and being vulnerable and understanding the filters that you view a conversation or a situation from, right? So as, as we've learned to do that, we're pushing it through the agency. Um, and we're also cognizant about just the words we use, right? So we no longer say down the agency. It's through the agency, really, because it's that hierarchical piece is only as good as it is on paper, right? But if you don't have the support coming from the different components of, of, of throughout the agency, whether it be the back office and fiscal or the DSPs, you know, we're actually doing the, or the teachers in our case, right, where they're dealing with the students, um, if that drops off, one of those pieces is conspicuous by its absence. And we can't allow to have that happen because there's lives at stake. And um, so we're trying to really start having these conversations about the even the words that we're using and um, that it's OK to be vulnerable. I think I might have referenced that before. It's OK to really say, I'm not in a good place right now. We do check ins with individuals to say, are you red, yellow or green? Because if you're red, I may have something I want to tell you that doesn't need to be discussed today. And we'll talk about it another time. Even being cognizant of where you are when I'm approaching you um, is, is something that we're trying to, it's a work in progress, right? It's very different than 
what we think of, you know, a couple of decades ago or even a decade ago about how businesses, everybody had to be on point. Everybody needs to know the answer. Everybody needs to be on, right? And um, we're realizing, especially in this industry, when you're dealing with individuals and humans, um, that you have to really look at a holistic approach to um, the entire system, right? The system of the individuals, the system of the division, the system of the agency. Um, so that's kind of some of the things that we're trying to, to do. All right. Thank you. Max, I think we just got a question really kind of for you because you mentioned the Donnie Family Committee. Uh, the question is, is there a network of parents that offer support to each other for mental wellness? Yeah, well, I think that's a good <clears throat> that's a good question. It's also a good segue to um, you know, you know, kind of focusing then on because we have been primarily talking about the staff and we certainly need, you know, to to have that discussion. It's very important. Um, but we, yeah, we do. We started the Donnie Family Committee uh, <clears throat> back in 2007. And, it, and it, it's really an educational group of, uh, you know, where we really try to help to educate parents on the different kinds of issues that are important to supporting their loved one. And, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, so that, that is one of them. One of the other very um, valuable organizations locally here is Parent Network of Western New York. And uh, Parent Network, I used to work there, used to lead that agency. And, um, you know, it's, a, it's an organization that really helps provide a lot of the support for families navigating the education system, the you know, the uh, disability system, the mental health system, and, and, and so on. And it's a, you know, it's an organization, um, it's a parent network, WNY.org. And, uh, you know, it's a very good organization. They have all kinds of workshops and, and mental wellness and help with, with uh, you know, developing those support systems is, you know, is certainly something that, you know, we're very big on. And, and really try to provide that kind of support. Um, I, a lot of what I learned to help my son, uh, you know, shifting to, you know, talking a little bit about, you know, uh, the family perspective is, is I learned it from other parents. I learned it from the parents that were, you know, that, that their, their loved ones were older and, um, you know, and the value of inclusion of, you know, being, you know, helping our you know, our loved ones, you know, being able to live their best lives and, and not being segregated, but being in the in the community. And that's why it's so important that we have, you know, as we transition and we're, we're Craig has been going out of our house now for 10 years. Uh, we're still part of dealing with that letting go process. Um, you know, my wife Joyce is, is not here right now, but she could tell you a litany of some of the feelings and issues that, you know, we both a feel and, and you know having our son living 25 miles away from us and um you know so you know we you know we've drawn other families to you know to share some of our concerns uh you know developing those uh you know support systems i think is valuable for the the dsps as well as family members because many times we feel very isolated as family members we feel are, have we done the right thing we did a lot of pushing for inclusion for our son you know, going through uh, school, you know, we really second kind of second guess ourselves, you know, did we do the right thing? You know, did we push hard enough? And, you know, do we alienate somebody? You know, uh, you know, all those kind of things as you're really trying to do and get the best that you can for your, you know, for your son or daughter, in our case with Craig, you know, you know, we would, we would knock down barriers for Craig and, and do whatever we could. But, you know, but it, it you know, it, it really does have an expense on the, you know, on the family members themselves, because many times, you know, you want to be strong advocates and, you know, but a lot of times those, those advocates, those helpers need help themselves. And I think you really, as, as Renee said, you need to be able to be vulnerable and to know, hey, we're human. You know, we may need help, not just from a support group, but maybe we need professional help. And, and you know, and that's okay. That's okay because the stresses and strains of being a parent also can be very, very difficult. And, you know, we've been blessed with Craig because he doesn't have, you know, serious medical issues. He doesn't have uh, behavioral issues. You know, he's able to work, you know, in the community competitively. He's friendly. He's outgoing. We've been blessed. When I work with some of the other families, 
I mean, their kids, you know, they have, be, you know, serious behavior issues. They are, you know, uh, and, you know, see a picture of Craig. I mean, he's, you know, he's, he's uh, you know, we are very blessed. That's why I really put a lot of time and effort into helping other families, you know, that are going through some very, very significant problems. And each of the agencies do have supports, as I mentioned, you know, uh, either family groups or tie into the, the Donnie Family Committee, you know, or, or Parent Network. And, and there are other ones, and, and certainly we have through the, uh, you know, uh, let's talk stigma org. We can also help and provide some other resources that are there right on our website. So, so Max, you touched on the segue. Uh, we'll, we'll go, we'll go from the agency piece. Now let's go to that, that family, a parent piece. Um, Cause I haven't, I have another question. Uh, and really Renee, uh, how do you deal with the guilt as a family member of feeling tired and stressed? I mean, you're a CEO and you have a son who has a developmental disability. Yeah, and there is guilt and it's real um, because you want to be, you know, the best parent and, you know, you you feel like you are, in my case, um, I'm a single parent. And so I'm, you know, really advocating for my son, um, thinking I'm doing the best and uh then something will happen and then i realize oh did i really do the right thing or did i talk to the people or did i do enough research or uh, should i kept looking longer right or um you know wasn't i not informed enough and and i can tell you as a ceo i find myself switching mental hats during the course of my day right because there are decisions that i'm having to make as a ceo that are that help me because I am a parent of a child with special needs, right? That I can look at it through a lens and a filter that I think provides me an ability to maybe address it in a different way. Um, but, but it's still, I'm the CEO. I spend a lot of time at work. Um, and I really have to say that my best is just going to be good enough. And, um, and, and have people around me, um, both personally and professionally, who um, who really help support me in in that, right? Like you know, so Renee, you can't make a five course meal for dinner every day, right? It's just not going to happen. <laughs> it's not going to happen, right? So you know, leftovers is perfectly fine. Driving through Panera or whatever, that's going to be fine, right? Much like my decision, I'm very fortunate that I have a very strong team throughout the agency here, right? So my job is to unleash their potential and be comfortable with saying, I don't know, and, and tell me what I need to know so I can be best informed to make that decision. And again, it goes back to that being vulnerable and giving yourself some grace, right? I mean, you can only pack so much into 24 hours. Some of that should probably include sleep um, and, and you know maybe a little exercise. And, and I will admit for many years as a parent, um, I was going to therapy on a regular basis because it was, you know, I've, I've always been a working professional and I had this beautiful gift of Marshall, um, you know, 21 years ago. And it's like, how do you live both lives? And you, you really can't do hundred percent simultaneously. You have to give yourself that grace that you might be 100% in family, but you're going to have to give a little bit something professionally. And it's really okay. But talk, find your people, find your tribe, find your friends, whatever it is that you need, and just talk to them because you will realize that you are not alone. And regardless of whether you're a CEO or where you're doing some something else in your career, or you're not, and you're just you know, and you're yeah, and you're doing things just within your home, um, it's a lot. But I, I had someone tell me years ago: give yourself the grace to understand that your best is absolutely good enough, and don't beat yourself up with because you you're the only person who's hearing that narrative in your head all day long, and um, that can really derail you if you let it. Um, and, and I think that's probably the best information that I've been given that I try to share with other parents, right? So, and, and I think Max might have pointed out that I latched on when Marshall was born to a family that I got very close with who had a son with Down syndrome, who was two years older than my son. 
And I've made that commitment that they've been my Sherpa trying to help the parent lifestyle, right? But then I have two families that um, have children a couple of years younger than my son that they tap into me. And I might not talk to them for a year, but when we are on the phone, we're talking and we're, you know, complaining and we're challenging each other and we're supporting each other. So I think um, that's what I would have to say about that, that it's normal to have the guilt, um, but don't let it get in your head. Thank you, Renee. Mm -hmm. Stacy, how, how about you with, with regard to the guilt? You, you have, you have a son. Who has a <laughs> yeah. Teacher, right. I, that's... Parent guilt is very, very real and very present in most moments of the day. But I find that if you are always operating with integrity in everything that you do, that you can rest easy at night knowing that you did your best. You did, you know, you made decisions based off of the information you had at, at the time and what was, you know, doing right. And you just have to be okay with whiffing it sometimes. You know, that's one of my favorite things to say is that sometimes you're not going to do the right thing. And you're only going to realize it at the end of the day when you go to lay down and you're like, I'm, I probably could have done that better, but you, you did the best you could at the time and you just have to be content with that. You have to just accept what was done and learn from it. You know, Hey, next time I'm going to be more aware of, of how I'm feeling when I approach this subject, because it kind of rattles me a little bit, or, or I'm just going to maybe start a conversation a little bit differently than I did today because it clearly didn't, you know, it's, it's just, Operate with integrity, be present in the moment, and then rest knowing you've done your best. Thank you. All right. Um, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask the question, this question, this, it's kind of, really, it's my last question. I have one more, but we'll, we'll kind of, we'll go through this as quickly as possible. Um, are there things that we can do better as a community to assist the DSPs and the population of people with disabilities, with developmental disabilities? Um, Renee, I'll start with you first. Um, be open to being an advocate and whatever that means. It doesn't necessarily mean to be a political advocate, although it could be, but just to be aware that there are people in the community who are diet, have some diagnosis of IDD and that they are able to contribute just as much as others in their own way, based on their own skill sets and the package that they came with and to be able to be open to that and aware of that and any place that you can insert yourself um, in that in that arena is is you're going to have a, a demonstrative impact for sure all right and max i'll ask you the same thing well i think one of the things that would be very helpful in the, that the community can do is like what <clears throat> uh, our son is working uh, at um, exploring more children's museum um, he loves it um, but they gave him an opportunity um, you know, they really wanted to have a diverse workforce. I mean, that was part of when they restarted, you know, and, and, and built that from the ground up at uh, Exploring More Children's Museum as an example. They really wanted to have not only, you know, serve individuals, you know, young kids that had all differing abilities, you know, from the you know, general population, but also, you know, including those with on the autism spectrum and those you know, they have various kinds of sensory issues and different kinds of needs and mobil mobility as well, but, um, but also wanted to hire a workforce that looked like those children. And, and, you know, and, you know, my son had Craig has Down syndrome, you know, and, you know, and, you know, and he's one of the face, he's one of the staff there. I mean, he's, he's a play to learn facilitator, you know, and, and, uh, you know, so I think if, if more, uh, businesses in the community would give more opportunities, you know, to those that are able to work in the community. It, it really helps, um, you know, uh, people with developmental disabilities to feel less isolated, more included, more satisfied because they're out working and doing things, the ones that are able to do that, you know, and, and it, there's less of that separation between, you know, um, and, and that's what we really valued when we were going through, you know, Craig going through school was, was he was just one of the kids. He was one of the guys, you know, he's, he's not one of them. He's one of us. And I think that's what the kind of community we need to develop is that, that it's, it's an us, not a we and them. And, and Stacy, what are your thoughts I mean, on I, 
I have to say, I wholeheartedly agree. I um, engage, engage with us. You, you know, just we want to. We're just people. You know, we're all people. People living and helping other people, and we we need the community as much as they need us. You know, we we grow and learn based off of the people that we surround ourselves with. So if you want to be as well-rounded as you can possibly be, then you need to be out there, you know, boots on the street, talking to people, getting out, doing things, going and living your life and seeing what's what we have to offer here, you know, and just having the community be receptive to that and just saying you're like, the doors are open, come on in is, is, you know, what I would love to see. And again, I think that the culture is changing and it should always be changing. And you know, we talked about being cognizant of the words we use, and I would love for the day when words like saying individual or community, that that's not even part of our vernacular anymore. It's just, they went out, they went out, you know, and, but we still have that divide. So I think it is important to be aware of it and kind of make, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So let's be loud about this. Let's point out these things so that way we can change them. And, you know, I'm just delighted to be a part of the progress. You know. Great. Right. Well, Renee, I, I have I kind of have one more question for you because you know this is this is an opportunity for the community to learn about what's going on. Uh, you know, generally, uh, there, there's a lot of confidentiality in the services that are being provided by the agencies. Um, but I also know, you know, you like to get the word out too because you need you need those DSPs. You need more and more workers, right? How do you communicate your services to the community so that they're aware of? you know, what's going on and where you're at and what you all do? Well, we're obviously taking advantage of social media, right? Because that's how a lot of information is exchanged right now. So we're having, we have virtual job fairs. We have a, um, it's your lucky, I think to, I think it's tomorrow. It's your lucky day um, open um, interviews, right? Where they're, we're actually having, you know, a spin the wheel for gifts and all kinds of things to bring people in off the street. We had an ice cream social um, uh, inner open interviews in the summer. So, um, and it's really educating people too on, you know, to, to Stacy's point and, and, and again, to, to Max's point about that these are just people, right? So some people, if they're not familiar with someone who has a diagnosis, it can be intimidating, right? Because you don't, you want to help, but you're uncomfortable because you don't know what to do. So, um, so we're really trying to, you know, that stigma, right? You know, we're trying to mitigate and remove that because it, at the end of the day, you know, in my case, my son's 21 years old, he's got Down syndrome, he's got blue eyes, he's got blonde hair, it's all genetic. And that's the, that's the package he came with, right? So that's kind of, um, you know, what we're trying to do kind of in our day to day, we also reach out with um, other um, organizations in the community to like we're, but Aspire. And I think people link too, if I'm not mistaken, is a member of the Buffalo Niagara Partnership, right? So we're actively engaged with the partnership that is our business community collective, right? And how, and, but being involved with them, we are helping to real, helping them realize that, um, you know, we're part of the community, as, as was mentioned before, just like everyone else. And uh, it's not as scary as it seems. And to, to really try to create that welcoming environment in different capacities. Well, thank you. Wonderful. So we're going to wrap up now. And I'm going to give each of you an opportunity just to provide a couple of closing remarks. Um, Max, why don't I start with you with, with regard to this terrific topic? Well, I think I think a lot was said, you know, and I and I really I guess the I guess the the, the take home for me is that um, you know th that um, you know we we have um, we're very blessed with with our with our son Craig and and we're really blessed we're working with a good, very good organization with with Aspire and also with People Inc because he gets support from People Inc as well. Um, but I think that I think family members need to work together with the DSPs. I think we didn't really talk about that as much as I'd like to see is that we really try to provide support for our, you know, for our staff. And, and uh, you know, again, you know, really appreciate this opportunity to, to talk about this. And, and uh, thanks, you know, for this kind of an opportunity. Thank you, Max. Stacy, how about you? Uh, well, also, you know, again, thank you. This is something that I, you know, am very passionate about in terms of just mental health wellness in general, just getting through life is hard for anybody, you know, and then when you factor in everything else that you do, it, it 
makes it hard. Um, I guess I would just hope that this just leads to more conversations that maybe if there is something where you're not connecting with the family that you support, you know, they're the individual that you support, you're not connecting with their family, you're not connecting with some aspect of their team, talk, open up that line of dialogue, just meet them where they're at as people. And, you know, it might resolve a lot of, of issues and make things a little bit easier to know that you aren't alone. You know, there is the other piece, the family piece, there is the the CEO piece, the everyone up the line, there is a massive circle of support for everyone that we just need to kind of get over our pride and rely on it when, when we need it, you know, and, and I hope it just opens up the dialogue for people to get help if they need it. Thank you, Stacy. Renee, I'm going to give you the last word. Well, thank you. So, and again, thank you so much. It's been really an honor to be with, you know, uh, Stacy and, and Max and certainly Frank. Uh, I appreciate the invite. Um, I'm just going to uh, be good to yourself and know that your best, as I said before, is truly good enough. You are not going to harm your child or loved one simply because you didn't ask that other question, right? If you're asking the question, you're doing the right thing. And so be good to yourself, allow yourself some grace um, and, and be curious. And, um, and at, at really at the end of the day, um, reach out and try to find people who are in your similar situation um, that may or may not be able to help, um, you know, may be able to help you. And it's okay to be stressed. And again, it's okay to be stressed. It's okay to be um, hard on yourself. So if you do need support or help, find someone who can help you in a professional context or find a family member or a friend or someone who can really, you can just kind of do that dump with that minimum, right? Because we all, we all need it. My poor dog is, is the recipient of all of that, but uh, for right now, so, but thank you. Well, thank you, thank you all of you. Uh, as a reminder to our audience, we need you to take the pledge to end stigma by going to our website, letstalkstigma.org. If your organization would like to join us, in our case, there is information on the website as well. Just click on the members tab and find out how. Together we can reduce stigma and create an environment of support where help seeking and help giving are the norm. Once again, I'd like to thank our panelists, Stacy Book, Max Donatelli, and Renee Phillip. I'd also like to thank everyone behind the scenes, Mike Telesco from Telesco Creative Group for his vision and technical support, Carol Doggett from the Mental Health Advocates of Western New York, and Karen Karaszewski from KKPR Buffalo for their support as well. So on behalf of the Erie County Anti-Stigma Coalition, until next time, I'm Frank Camerata. Stand up to stigma and best wishes on your wellness journey. Take care, everyone. Thanks.